Amen. Turn to Genesis 25. Um, I have a quote I want to read from. It's written in, back in the 1880s. I'll give you the first two initials of the guy's name, and you still won't get it right. I'll ask you if you know. C.H., so when we hear C.H., we usually think of one person. Anyway, this is written, what C.H., and I'll give you his name in a moment. The Word of God is not loved and studied. Again, this is from the 1880s. Either privately or publicly. Trashy literature is devoured in private and music. Ritualistic services and imposing ceremonies are equally sought after in public. Thousands will flock to hear music and pay for admission. But how few care for the meeting to read the Holy Scriptures. These are facts, and facts are powerful arguments. We cannot get over them. There is a growing thirst for religious excitement and a growing distaste for the calm study of Holy Scripture and the spiritual exercises of the Christian assembly. It is perfectly useless to deny it. We cannot shut our eyes to it. The evidence of it meets us on every hand. Thank God there are a few here and there who really love the Word of God and delight to meet in holy fellowship for the study of its precious truths. May the Lord increase the number of such and bless them till traveling days are done. So, C-H... No. Do you have any... Who else? Any other C-H's you can think of? I didn't know it, so when I found the quote, it's Macintosh. C-H Macintosh. Yeah, it's a mystery. But he wrote around the same, he wrote a lot of stuff. He was a pastor for many years. So a great quote, though, and it's very timely for where we are today in our society. We need to really focus on God's Word and not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some. But in Genesis 25, we left off last time looking at Rebekah and Isaac becoming husband and wife. Isaac was 40 years old when they got married. We don't know how old Rebekah was. It doesn't tell us. She may have been very young. She may have been 20 years old, maybe even younger. We don't know. But as we saw, the Lord certainly brought them together, and He would bless them. He would use them in fulfilling His plans and His promises that He gave to Abraham and Sarah. The biggest promise was that through Isaac, the son of promise, would come into the world and he would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. The ultimate fulfillment of that, as you know, is Jesus Christ. He would come through this lineage. Now, as we'll see, Isaac, he was the quiet patriarch. When we read of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham, there's a lot of chapters written about him. Jacob, a lot of chapters written about him, but not very many written about Isaac. A lot of people over the years have kind of put Isaac down because his life was rather boring compared to his more famous dad and his, more, his famous son, Jacob. But I don't think that's a real fair assessment of Isaac. Um, I would say there's a lot more people like Isaac in the body of Christ than there are people like Abraham and Jacob. There's a lot of people that are quiet behind the scenes, not very vocal about things. Yes, Isaac was laid back and quiet, but at the same time, he was very important to the overall picture and plans of God's Word. And uh, I say that because a lot of Christians, they get discouraged or they get down on themselves because they don't think that their quiet Christian life really matters. Well, your life does matter. You know, God created you, and He has a plan and purpose for all of us. We all have different roles. We all have different responsibilities. Not everybody on the body of Christ is going to be a mouth <laughs> like me, <laughs> but we all have different roles and responsibilities that we're supposed to be part of the body. And nobody can say, oh, this part of the body is not necessary. This part, nah, it's not any important. No, all the members of the body need to work together. Uh, for the glory of God. And I think God has great rewards for those faithful, uh, behind-the-scenes Christians you don't ever hear much about, but you know they're praying for maybe missionaries over in Africa and Asia, India, or they're you know giving towards that ministry. You don't hear much about them, but you know God knows that they're serving Him. They're blessing others. They're praying, interceding for other people. God loves all of His children equally, and He loves it when we love one another and encourage one another, pray for one another, bless one another, um, minister to one another. There's all those one another's in the New Testament. And God simply wants all of us to be faithful in the everyday things of life. 
And then as you're faithful, he'll bring other things into your life. He'll give you more opportunities. When you're faithful in the little things God gives you, then he will bring greater opportunities down the road. Keep that in mind as we look at Isaac and Rebecca's lives in the next couple of chapters. This chapter is interesting because it kind of bounces around. It's kind of a shotgun approach with this chapter. But first of all, we're going to look into Abraham. He is winding down his life. We saw with Abraham in chapter 23, that's when he buried his beloved wife, Sarah, um, in the um, cave of Machpelah. She was 127 years old. That means Abraham was 137 years old. That means Isaac, take away 100 from Abraham, and Isaac was 37 years old. And in chapter 24, it was Abraham who sent his eldest servant, Eliezer, remember God's helper. And he goes back to Abraham's um, family, finds a bride, Rebekah, for Isaac, his son. As I mentioned a moment ago, Isaac was 40 years old when he got married. So Abraham would have been 140. Now, you would think that Abraham was pretty much winding down his life at 140 years old, but we're going to see. He lived another 35 years, and he is going to get remarried and he's going to have six more sons. And whatever kind of diet that guy was on, I want to know what it was. I mean, it's pretty amazing. So that's what this old widower, widower do, does. He gets remarried to this gal named Keturah, and they will have six sons together. When God blessed Abraham, he declared him righteous. It also says that God told Abraham he was going to bless him with many nations. Not just the nation of Israel, but other nations would come forth from him. We know from his son Ishmael, you know, the Arab people would come. But also through these other sons, we'll see some uh, nations mentioned here. So let's pick up in chapter 25, uh, verse 1. It says, Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian. Remember the Midianites? Ishbak and Shua, Jokshan begot Sheba and Dedan. That's where Saudi Arabia would become from those guys. And the sons of Dedan were Ashuram, Letsuam, Let. I don't know how to pronounce these. You know, you, you guys can wing it. This one, Lemimimim, I don't know. God knows. If you talk to a Hebrew, talk to a Jewish person, have them pronounce his name, then go talk to another Hebrew and have them pronounce It'll be two different pronunciations. So I'm not the only one that cannot pronounce these names. And the sons of Midian were Ephah, Epher, Hanuk, Abadah, and Eldaah. So if you're having kids, here's the list for you. And all these were children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, that's towards Saudi Arabia, away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. So the big takeaway from these verses is this. Notice that Abraham gave gifts to all of his sons that he had fathered. That simply means he, because Abraham was very, very wealthy at this point, and he gives all of his offspring financial resources to live, and he provided for them. But notice in verse 5 it says here, he gave Isaac all that he had, and, and that's important. It specifically tells us that Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, because Isaac alone would receive the inheritance that would pass down from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob down that lineage. It's all part of God's covenant. In Galatians 4, we are linked together with Isaac as sons and children of promise. Look at this verse in Galatians 4.28. It says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. In other words, everybody who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ alone, we have been given the spiritual inheritance that comes through Isaac and Jacob and down the line. We have received a spiritual will. That spiritual inheritance we've received through Abraham and Isaac is infinitely more valuable than any earthly inheritance you may ever receive this side of heaven. Because if you get an earthly inheritance, well, wait a few months when Biden's in office, you're not going to have anything left. 
You know, he's already saying 70% tax on your inheritance. Anyway, that's stupid, sorry. Um, but Abraham left us with a great inheritance. It's very clear uh, that he gave us this understanding that we are saved by grace through faith alone in God's word alone. For us, it's faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Abraham was declared righteous by faith. Abraham was not declared righteous because he kept the law. Think about it. Abraham did not have the law. The law did not come until Moses over 400 years later. So that's not why he was justified by any law keeping. It was simply because he believed the word of the Lord and the Lord accounted it to him for righteousness. He was not saved by circumcision. That was a big deal in the first century of the church. Remember in Acts 15, all those Judaizers, Christ, Jews, Jews that became Christians, many of them wanted the Gentiles to get circumcised in order to be saved. No, that's not how you're saved. Again, it's faith alone and Christ alone. Circumcision came during Abraham's life, but many years after he was already justified by faith in the Lord. Abraham also set forth a very um, beautiful picture of what a faithful life looks like. In the book of James, he uses Abraham to illustrate the importance of proving our faith, living out our faith, not just talking about it, but living out our faith for others to see. And we see that with Abraham. Wherever he went, he would build an altar to the Lord. He would build an altar because he was showing people around him that visible testimony. I am not ashamed of the God of Yahweh. I'm not ashamed of the one true God over all of creation. So he would build an altar and worship the Lord. Wherever he planted, wherever he built and you know, pitched his tent, we also saw that in obedience to the Lord, he offered up his only begotten son, Isaac. Even though he had other kids, Isaac is the promised son, even as Jesus would be offered up as the sacrifice for our sins. Also through Abraham came the amazing nation of Israel through which God would give us the word of God. The word of God shows us who Jesus Christ is. And it's all because Abraham lived out his faith. He didn't hide his faith under a bushel, so to speak. So ultimately, we came into salvation through Jesus Christ, that free gift that he offers us. Well, look at verse 7. This is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. So there's a few things to look at in these verses. Notice, first of all, he lived to be 175 years old. Here's something amazing to think about is that his great, 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 great grandfather was Shem. Remember Shem? Shem was 100 years old when he got on the boat, the ark, that he helped his dad Noah built. So Noah was... Abraham's great-grandfather to the sixth time. Shem was his great-grandfather to the fifth time. Shem was 100 years old when he gets on the ark. It says that Shem lived 500 years after the flood. Abraham, when he was born, Adam was, or uh, Noah was still alive. Think about that. You wonder, how do these guys know about the flood? How do they know about all these things in the past? Because Noah was still alive when Abraham was born. He was probably about 40 years old when Noah died. Shem outlived Abraham. That's amazing to think about. So he's 175 now. Shem lived beyond Abraham, and Shem was on the ark. The, the book of Jasher, which is not a biblical source, but it's a historical source, it says that Abraham spent a lot of time growing up with his great, 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 great grandfather, Shem and Noah. And uh, that would be awesome to think about. But anyway, further from the days of Noah's flood, we see the, short, the shorter lifespan coming on. You know, Noah lived to be 950. Shem lived to be 600. But every generation after that, it goes down, down, down pretty quick. Here's 175. Isaac will be 180 when he dies. Jacob will be... I'm spacing 137, but it slowly goes down, settles around 80-ish or so years old where we are today. Anyway, here we see Abraham dying at 175 years old. Notice it says he was gathered to his people. Now, what does that mean? 
After all, Sarah was the only one who died and was buried in the cave of Machpelah. Well, to be gathered with his people is a reference to those who died in faith, like Noah, like all those Old Testament saints beyond, you know, before the flood that came to faith and trust in God, in the Lord. So being gathered to his people probably refers to the place Jesus would call Abraham's bosom. That's where the dead in, you know, before Christ, the dead people would go into Sheol or Hades, as it was called. There was two compartments in Sheol and Hades. One side was a place of torment. The other side was a place of peace and rest. All who died before Christ came, they would go to the place of peace and rest if they had their faith in the Lord. All those who died before Christ came, they would go into the place of torment if they did not receive the Lord, if they did not believe God's word. Before Christ came, people who died went to Sheol, they went to Hades, simply called the place of the dead. Jesus tells us that that place had a great chasm or gulf between the two. If you look, we don't have time to look at it all, but chapter 16 of the book of Luke is where Jesus talks about Lazarus and the rich man. Not the Lazarus he rose from the dead, but a different one. Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus dies, he goes to, Jesus says, Abraham's bosom. The rich man died. He was not a believer. It says he went into the place of torment. In that place, the, the rich man in torment was fully conscious. People don't just uh, are annihilated. That's not true. He's in a place of torment. He cries out across the gulf, Father Abraham, send someone over here. Send Lazarus over here just with a drop of water on his finger that he might you know, quench my thirst on my tongue because I'm in torment in the flames. And then Abraham said, nobody can pass from here to you, and nobody over there can pass from there to here where we are. So that gulf, that cavern was there. It was known as paradise where Abraham was. Remember when Jesus died on the cross? Just before he died, the thief, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so when the thief died, he went into Abraham's bosom. What did Jesus do? After he died, it says he led captivity captive. That's when the the saints in the Old Testament, they were raised up, brought into the presence of the Lord. Hades, hell, now it's just a place of torment for all those who die without the Lord. But now if you, if you die in Christ, you will be taken into the very presence of our great God and Savior, Jesus. Look at these verses, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Paul says, We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So when you leave this body, as a believer, you go straight into glory with the Lord. There's no such thing as soul sleep. Some people believe you die, you just go to sleep until the resurrection. That's not what the Bible says. And here Paul proves it in Philippians 1, 21 to 23. Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ. So as long as I'm in this body, I'm going to live for Jesus. And to die is gain there's no gain if you just go and sleep in a grave somewhere. There's great gain if you go to be with Jesus. But if I live on in the flesh, in this body, this will mean fruit from my labor. In other words, I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. It's far better to go home and be with Jesus. That's why we don't fear death today. Because once we're out of this body, we're in His presence spiritually. At the rapture of the church, He comes and He raises us up. That's when we receive our resurrection bodies. And we go home to be with Him in our resurrection bodies. So the bottom line is, Abraham died. It says he was gathered to his people. and They were in a place of peace and comfort and rest. Notice it also says here, he died an old man and full of years. In other words, Abraham didn't just have a lot of years in his life. He had a lot of life in his years. And that's important. That's how we should all live. It doesn't matter how long you live. Just live each day for the Lord. That's what counts. You don't want to waste all your days that God has given you just for yourself, for your flesh. But live each day for God's glory. That's the important thing. You know, I look back when I first got saved, 1977, um, the first Christian, I, I mean, I was listening to all kinds of nasty stuff when I was 
a pagan in, in college at San Diego State, and then I get saved. First Christian I ever heard was a guy named Keith Green. Some of you may have heard of Keith Green. And, I mean, he was on fire for the Lord. He was fiery, kind of a prophet kind of guy, just preaching it. But he was, his music was convicting. <laughs> you know, sometimes some thought it was condemning. But no, he was really going for it. But he was young. He died at 28 years old. And I think, man, why, Lord? He was only 28. Look up his music. I mean, it's powerful stuff. And I don't know why the Lord took him home at 28 years old. He was having a huge impact on the body of Christ in a good way. He packed a lot of years in 28 years. There's a lot of life in that. So it's not how long you live. Some people think, i got to live to be 100 and whatever. Jack LaLanne. Remember, he said, I'm going to live to be 150. Well, he didn't make it. Not even close. We did a funeral recently for a guy named Jamin. Remember Jamin? He did a bunch of work for Jack LaLanne out there, and he was always going out there witnessing to Jack LaLanne. And hopefully he got saved. I don't know. But that's the only reason Jamin went out there, because he was good friends with Jack LaLanne's son, John. And so he went out there to help you know, his dad uh, you know, do this work in the bathroom and get it handicap accessible. And, and he would brag, I'm going to live to be 150. So what if he did? Without Jesus... It's a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. If you die at 28 with Jesus, you're in glory forever and ever. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul and be destroyed? Well, let's get back on topic. Verse 9. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried and Sarah his wife. Now we haven't seen much about Ishmael for a while. Remember he was kind of pushed out uh, by Sarah said to Abraham, you need to put Hagar and this, the boy away after he was mocking. Remember when Isaac was being weaned? He was about three or four. That means Ishmael was about 17 or 18. And, and Sarah's like, you need to get them out of here. And so they left. And last we saw of Ishmael, he goes down to Egypt with his mom and he marries an Egyptian. God told Abraham he was going to bless Ishmael because Abraham really loved his son Ishmael. Even though he was not the son of promise, Ishmael really loved his dad Abraham. And so here we see Abraham and Ishmael, to, or Isaac and Ishmael together burying their dad Abraham. At this scene, Abraham is 175 years old when he dies, so that would make Isaac how old? 75. Just take away 100. That means Ishmael is about 89 years old at this time. They probably had a lot of catching up to do. They hadn't seen each other in many, many years. But now we'll see Ishmael has 12 sons. That was fulfilled prophecy God gave to Hagar. Abraham, or Isaac at this time, has two sons. Isaac would have Ishmael, or Esau and Jacob. So if Isaac is 75 here, that means... Esau, Jacob are 15-year-old twins. Because we'll see in a moment, um, Isaac was 60 when they are born. A lot of catching up to do. Interesting thing, though, to me is, I mean, I've done a lot of funerals over the years, but it's really wonderful when God brings families together and brings reconciliation many times. Family members that have been, you know, distant, there's been animosity, you know, there's just been, you know, that estrangement, and yet oftentimes we'll find healing and reconciliation at times like this. So maybe, you know, it was a good time for Ishmael and Isaac to be together. Well, look at verse 11. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt at Beer Lahai Roy. Now, remember Beer Lahai Roy. What does it mean? Beer, B-E-R, B-E-R is the well. So this is the well of him who sees me and the one who lives. So this is the well 
Who named this well Bir Lahai Roy? You remember? Hagar. The first time Hagar gets pregnant because Sarah told Abraham, take my handmaid Hagar, have a son by her. So she gets pregnant. And then Sarah gets all mad at her. Get out of here. She, it says the wrath of Sarah drove her away. So she's out in the wilderness. Bir Lahai Roy is what she calls this place. The well of him who sees and hears. And you know what happens there? Jesus appeared to her. The angel of the Lord. And Jesus says, I know what you're going through. I see what you're going through. I hear what you're going through. In fact, you're going to name that child in you Ishmael. The Lord said, name her Ishmael, which means God hears. So that's interesting. Here, Isaac, many years later, this is where Isaac is living in the same place that Hagar fled to. Verse 12. Now, this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these were the names of the sons of Ishmael, by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth, Nebioth, then Kedar, Adbiel, Mibsam, Mishma, you guys keeping record, you getting friends having babies, Duma, Masa, Hadar, Tima, Jetur, Nephish, and Kedema. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names by their towns and their settlements, twelve princes according to their nations. These were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, going towards Saudi Arabia, as you go toward Assyria. He died in the presence of all his brethren." Now remember, it was back in chapter 17, verse 20, that God told Abraham, I will bless Ishmael. You know, he, God didn't hate Ishmael. God loved Ishmael, but he was not the chosen son. He was not the son of promise. But he says, I'm going to make Ishmael exceedingly fruitful. In fact, God tells Abraham he will have 12 princes. So this is the fulfillment of God's word of promise to Abraham concerning his son of the flesh, Ishmael. So here we see that God did bless him. He fulfilled his word concerning Ishmael's descendants. As you remember, Ishmael became the father of the Arab people. There's how many, like one and a half billion Arabs in the world today? This is where they get their start, was with Ishmael having these 12 sons. God loves Arab people. He doesn't love Islam, but he loves Arab people. Jesus died for all people. It doesn't matter where you're from or what your background is. Jesus loves everybody. He paid the price for all sin, but people must come to him for salvation. Where um, Ishmael dies is actually not very far from where Isaac was now living. So I don't know if they stayed in touch or not, but be that as it may, verse 19. This is a genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. So it's a lot shorter than Ishmael's. Abraham begot Isaac, verse 20. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padam Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. In, in a few verses, we'll see that he was 60 years old when she conceives and has the twins. Rebecca and Isaac, they had to patiently wait six, uh, 20 years before this promise of a child. One thing I hope you notice is we've gone through these chapters concerning Noah and Abraham and the rest of them. God's timing is different than our timing. His ways are higher than our ways. He's on a whole different time schedule than we are. God never panics. He never is in a hurry. He never worries because God is sovereign. God is in control. And that is so unlike us. So often we're like, okay, I just pray, God, where's the answer? Come on, hurry up. I got places to go, people to see. Answer me, God. And we get all upset because God is patient. God is, his timing is right. It's always perfect. He's got purposes for us having to wait for a promise, for an answer, 
that we're not, we probably won't even know of until we get to heaven. And then he'll say, this is why I waited. And then I'll be like, oh, okay. Then it'll make sense. Now we get up, you know, impatient and we want him to hurry up. Think of this. After he told Noah he was going to destroy the world with a flood and everybody on it, except for him and his family and the animals, God waited over 100 years for the flood to come. During that time, Noah was building an ark. It took him over 100 years to build that ark. When he told Abraham and Sarah they were going to have a son who would be the son of promise, he was 75 years old when God told Abraham that. How old was he when he had Isaac? 100. So he had to wait 25 years for that promise to come about. I mean, God's timing is different. We'll see what Jacob... He's going to work for 14 years to finally get to leave with the bride of his choosing, which was Rachel. But he had to wait 14 years before he could leave with Rachel. Joseph will have to wait nearly 20 years before he's reconciled with his brothers that sold him into slavery in Egypt. Look at these verses. Psalm 90, verse 2. This is powerful. The psalmist says, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We don't know how long we have, but we need to make every day count for the Lord. So teach us to take each day seriously is what the psalmist is saying. You know, we don't want to waste all this time God has given us. Psalm 37, this is what King David says, verses 7 through 9. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. So, you know, whatever goes on in Washington, D.C., don't fret about what they're doing and how they're scheming and everything else. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. So turn off Fox News once in a while. Do not fret. Again, David says, it only causes harm, for evildoers shall be cut off. That's God's promise. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Again, God's timing is best. His promises are sure. God always knows what's going on. We need to trust Him. So here we see Isaac pleading with the Lord on behalf of his wife, Rebekah. They haven't had children. You know, waited 20 years. But think of this. Isaac knew. Well, I'm the child of promise. God's promised all these descendants after me. Okay, Lord, i got to start pleading here because my wife's getting older. We don't have kids. How is this all going to play out if we don't have any kids? We're part of this process. And so he starts crying out to the Lord. He starts praying to the Lord. He says he's pleading with the Lord here. One thing you got to admire about Isaac, he learned a very valuable lesson on what not to do. Remember what his dad did, Abraham. They get impatient. Go into Hagar, have a son by her. That was not a good thing. So he just calls out to the Lord. He didn't try to make something happen. He waits on the Lord, he calls on the Lord, then he turns it over to the Lord. And when he did, we see here that Rebecca conceives, and now she's pregnant with twins. Now things get interesting. Check this out in verse 22. But the children struggled together within her. And she said... If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. So she's having quite the pregnancy. I mean, it's like, you know, a wrestling match going on inside of her. And it's like, what's going on, Lord? If all is well, why is this happening to me? Why are these, you know, kids in here just, it's like a fight going on. I don't know if any of you moms ever felt that way when you were pregnant, where you felt like, uh, there's like a wrestling mat. They're doing gymnastics in there. I remember with our firstborn, Christine, um, Elizabeth said, hey, check this out. And he's, she'd be laying there, and all of a sudden you see it across her stomach. And I'm like, oh, I was young. You know, before I was a dad, I'm thinking, what is this thing going to pop its head out? And it's like, wow, this is crazy. But can you imagine having twins in there, and they're just going at it like this? Listen to how God answers her prayer, though, about this wrestling match inside of her. Verse 23, And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So God gives her a prophecy concerning her twins. God is going to choose the younger 
in this case Jacob, over the older Esau, the firstborn. That's in direct opposition to how things were normally done. The firstborn was almost always the one who would be given the, the birthright, be given the blessing, would be given the double portion of the inheritance. That's usually how it worked. And then the younger siblings would be subservient to the firstborn. In this case, God changes things around. Jacob, the secondborn, will become the one whom God chooses. He'll be the head of the nation of Israel. He will bring forth the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob will have his name changed by God to Israel. Now, we'll also see that the firstborn, Esau, he could care less about his birthright. We'll see that he was more concerned about the things of the flesh, the things of this world. He was not concerned about the things of the Lord. There's an interesting correlation between Esau and Jacob and what's going inside of us as Christians. Oftentimes, there's a wrestling match going on inside of your life. Remember what we saw last time. Rebecca represents a type of the church. You and I, as members of the body of Christ, the church, we got a wrestling match going on in us. The firstborn, Esau, a man of the flesh. Your natural birth, you're a man of the flesh, a woman of the flesh. You need a second born, second birth, which is when you spiritually come alive to Jesus. But there's still this wrestling match going on inside of us. You know, Paul talks about this in Romans 7. He says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing. What's the solution? Well, at the end of Romans 7, verse 24 and 25... Check these verses out. This is where Paul comes to the end of himself. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Notice he says, who will deliver me? He doesn't say, what's going to deliver me? He doesn't say, how am I going to be delivered? I mean, there's all kinds of how-to books and all kinds of things about, you know, how you need to be, how you should live. No, it's not a who. It's a who. It's not a what or a how. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Here's the answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where you are set free. That's where the delivery comes from, from the flesh, is to trust in Jesus. Die to yourself. Let Jesus come alive within you. So then we, uh, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul says it like this in Galatians 5.16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, that's your born-again nature, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And as we'll see, Jacob was not chosen by God because he was so spiritually minded and he was so righteous because he wasn't. But God chose Jacob because he would show Jacob his grace and his goodness and his power through Jacob's life. And just as Jacob was a little rough around the edges throughout his life, so are we. None of us are perfect. None of us have arrived but here's the good thing that Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, and being confident of this very thing, that he, the Lord, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's when you're going to roll off the assembly line and, and be a perfect whatever in the image of Christ. After he's molded you and shaped you, you'll be perfect in that sense. Until then, we still struggle. We still mess up. We still say things that are hurtful. Yes, we humble ourselves. We repent. But it's an ongoing battle. So who will deliver us? Who will set us free? Jesus. Verse 24. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name... Harry. <laughs> that, that's what Esau means, Harry. So he, there's where Harry came from. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. What does Jacob mean? Heel catcher. 
It also came to mean deceiver or conniver. <laughs> and we'll see how that plays out with his life. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. A couple of important things to take note of here. In verse 28, it says, Isaac loved Esau. That's interesting to me because Jacob was a lot more like his dad than Esau was. Jacob was mild manner, kind of a stay-at-home kind of a guy like Isaac was. Esau, more of a you know, outdoorsman, woodsman, hunter. He goes out there and gets his game, brings it back. And so Isaac liked that about his son. It was because of that, it says, that he loved his son Esau. It's pretty common to see parents that you know, try to live vicariously through their children. You'll often see parents you know, who are good at something you know, really pushing their child to succeed. It could have been a sport, could have been a business, all kinds of different things. But it's okay as long as you don't be, let it become an obsession because the goal is not for us as parents to try to mold and shape our grandkids or our children, now our grandkids. We, it's not up to us to try to mold them and shape them to be like us. No, we want to push them, not push, we want to introduce them Point them to Jesus because he's the master potter. Jesus is the one we want to see them, him mold them and shape them more and more into his image and likeness, not our own. That's the goal of parents. Notice also here in verse 28, we see the reason why Isaac loved Esau. Notice it says, because he ate of his game. What does it say about Rebekah? Rebekah loved Jacob. One is conditional love, one is unconditional love. These two statements are powerful because we see that our flesh, which Esau represents, tries to give reasons for being loved. In other words, well, God loves me because look at all the good things I do for God. Or God loves me because I'm trying so hard to live a Christian life. That is so wrong. That's not why we love. That's not why God loves us. That's conditional love. But God loves us unconditionally. In other words, God loves us not because of what we do, but God loves us because the Bible says God is love. You can't figure it out. He just loves you unconditionally. Rebecca's love was unconditional. She loved Jacob, period. That's how God loves us, unconditionally. Here's a great couple verses in Deuteronomy that kind of brings this to light. Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8. This is Moses talking to the Israelites about why God chose them. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, this is great because this can be applied to all of us as well. Why did God choose us to be his people? Because God loves us. Well, why does God love us? Because God is love. It's that simple. You don't earn it. You, can't de you don't deserve it. He just loves you. This is what a, a great thing that Pastor Chuck taught on many times over the years. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. He would always drive this home where it says, we love God because He first loved us. That's why we love God, because He first loved us. God is always the initiator. We're simply the responders. We respond to Him out of love because He first loved us. He put His love into us. We can't love Him without the Holy Spirit working love into us. He's always the initiator. God created us for fellowship, but how sad that most people reject God's love because He loves everybody. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever will believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But how sad that most people are on that broad road that leads to destruction. They don't want 
the love of Jesus. He won't force his love on anybody, but it's available to anybody who will come to him by faith. The greatest demonstration of God's love for all humanity, it's seen at the cross where Jesus paid the price in full. He took the punishment for our sins in full. He hung on the cross and shed his blood for our sins. Paul says this, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's when he demonstrated his love. Not because you did anything. Long before you could do anything good or bad, God sent his son Jesus. That's the demonstration that he loves sinners like us. Verse 29, Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. Edom also means red, like Esau. Or hairy, but red, like the stew. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. I mean, you look at this and you just see how messed up Esau's priorities were. He was just after the flesh. He could care less about the things of the spirit. Sarcastically, he's basically saying, I can't eat my birthright. What good is that to me? He's like the unsaved people of the world. He could only see with his physical eyes. He could only you know, be concerned with material things. He didn't understand the things of the spirit. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned or spiritually understood. But Jacob, he knew the importance of the birthright. Jacob knew, I'll get a double portion of the inheritance because of this birthright. I mean... He knows that he would be in the role as a spiritual leader in the home because of this birthright. And he would make sure that the family was taken care of because of this spiritual birthright. He took this seriously. So this was not a light thing. This is why we read of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You never read about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. You won't ever find it. This is what Hebrews 12 tells us, verse 16, about Esau. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Again, we don't comprehend how important the birthright was in our society, but that was a huge thing. I mean, Jacob, yeah, he's conniving, but he's wanting something that was very, very important. Esau could care less about it. But you and I need to realize that God has given us great and precious promises. And we need to not only appreciate all that God has given us, but we need to be good stewards over all that God has given us. Because Jesus talks a lot about being a good steward. When, when he gave, used that illustration, be a steward. Here he gave one steward, you know, 10, 5, 1, the other two, they go off and they make more. The guy that was given one talent, he goes and he buries it because he was not a good steward. We don't want to bury what God has given us. We want to use what God has given us. No matter how small or big or important you might think it is, use everything God has entrusted to us for God's glory. It's so important. Jesus wants us to be good stewards. Paul says, this is what God has given me a stewardship over. The most important thing in Paul's life was being a good steward with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's entrusted all of us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
doesn't mean you all of us have to go out on street corners with a sign and call people to repentance and turn to Christ, but he wants us to be light and salt wherever we are, whatever we're doing in the office, at school, wherever we are, he wants us to be good stewards over the things he's entrusted to us. But always remember, whatever you do for the Lord, let it be a motivation from God's love encouraging you to go for it with Jesus. Not because you're trying to earn something. You can't earn anything from God. Not because you think you deserve something if you do these things. No. God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And he's saying here, let my love for, you know, pour into your life and then let it out of your life. And then it's that motivation of love that will encourage you to be a light, to be salt, to you know, come up to somebody at work that's struggling and hurting and just sit down with them and say, hey, what, what's going on? And, and then talk to them about Jesus and how Jesus can set them free or whatever. I mean, God opens up so many doors when we're open to him. Everything Paul went through, he's such an example because you look at Paul's life, he was beaten up numerous times, used cat of nine tails, 39 lashes five times, thrown into prison numerous times. You know, he was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra. I mean, this guy, why did he do it? Why didn't he say, you know what, I'm old, man. I'm tired of getting beat up. I'm going to go sit on the Mediterranean, nice little hut there, and just enjoy the waves and the sunshine. Why did he keep going for it? In 2 Corinthians 5, he says, it's the love of Christ that constrains me, or the love of Christ is what motivates me to keep going. Because he knew the only way people were going to be set free from their sin and go to heaven and be with Jesus forever was to share the gospel with them. And so that is what God is calling us to do. Be light and salt. Be a good steward with all that he's entrusted to your life.